It is just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Angus Pryor all the way from Sydney, Australia, where my brother Paul Ferran lives. Angus is a marketer, author, and speaker. After more than a decade in sales and marketing, working alongside dentists, physicians, and vets, Angus founded Dental Profit System in 2014. He holds a master's degree in marketing from the University of Southern Queensland and several management diplomas. He has undertaken extensive personal study into digital and direct marketing over the past five years, which led him to being certified as a Google partner. At Dental Profit Systems, he surrounds himself with a hand-picked team of experts in related fields. This includes experts in copywriting, graphic design, pay-per-click, advertising, SEO, and website development. Angus is an author, having recently co-authored The Better Business Book, providing business owners with 100 lessons to live by, which has an amazing 55 five-star reviews. Now that's in the dental space. That's just incredible. Angus writes for Australian Dental Practice, Australian Dentists, and Australian Dental Association's New Bulletin Magazine. He has a growing network of clients around Australia. He hosts Marketing Monday, a video series that provides dentists with quick, actionable tips to boost their dental marketing. And I get to have lunch with you because I'm lecturing in Melbourne, Australia. So I get to uh, come down there, and uh, and you're not going to believe this. You're not going to believe this. When I'm in Sydney, my brother will be in London. Ha! Huh. How messed up is that? I mean, but uh, but he's coming. He's coming to visit me uh, uh, Friday for the weekend because he wants. Uh, he's going to raft the uh, Grand Canyon, the Colorado River down the Grand Canyon. So uh, so tell me this. Um, for all of our listeners around the world, uh, what's the Australian dental market looking like these days? Yeah, it's a great question, Howard. Um, look, to be honest, it's pretty tough. Uh, I did a presentation at the ADA. I have to, when we say ADA, we mean Australian Dental Association, not American. Um, they had a Congress, um, and I, I did some numbers before that, and Look, you know, the population of Australia is, I think, around 25 million. So it's like one fifteenth of the US population or whatever it is. And we've had more than 2,000 new dentists join the Australian workforce in the last three years. And that is, that's way faster growth than what the Australian population is growing at. So uh, to be honest, the, the, a lot of dentists here are doing it a bit tough because there's a lot of dentists around and a lot of competition. I think it's something like they've had a 10% growth in the last three years and there's no way Australia's population has grown by that amount. So so if you got 25 million people and 20,000 dentists, that means there's a dentist for every 1,250 people, whereas the United States um, is a dentist for about every 1,850. So the question begs, how did 2,000 new dentists show up in Australia in three years? Um, we... We have a lot of our universities are generating dentists and uh, it's interesting that's happened in a number of areas for healthcare professionals. Howard, it wouldn't surprise you to know that there can be a bit of politics involved and um, let's say you're the uh, representative for a particular state and you say, well, you know, in regional areas and rural areas, there's not enough dentists, so we need a dental school in my state. Uh, and it's happened in, you know, for doctors, for vets, for dentists, and so they just end up producing all these extras. Um, then on top of that, I guess there's been fairly strong levels of migration for dentists into Australia, although I believe the, the kind of leg up that they've got through the immigration system has been turned off. Uh, but nevertheless, it's, yeah, there's a, a lot of them being produced. Now, Johnny Depp called me yesterday and told me when I come to Australia, I can't bring my dog. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, I was aware of that story. Um, yes, you've got to be careful. I mean, look, the curious thing about Australia, of course, is we're this whopping big island. So that means that um, we don't have a lot of the diseases and stuff. And so we're tough in customs, we're tough in quarantine, and we're tough in immigration. And I also read that you have seven of the 10 deadliest snakes in the world are on Australia. Yes, that's true. Um, there's a travel writer whose name is on the tip of my tongue, uh, and it'll come to me in a minute. And uh, he was talking about um, 
you know, traveling around Australia and he was somewhere rather and the, uh, I guess the ranger uh, said, look, if you see one of these deadly snakes, um, what you need to do is just stand still and it'll slither over the top of your shoe and, you know, that'll be the end of that. And he described it as the piece, the least likely to be used piece of advice he'd ever received in his life. So, yes, that, we that do. sounds like uh, the Australian Snake Association wrote that piece. They probably yeah. hired a copywriter. Uh, I don't know. They, um, said, they, they probably said, uh, if you see a snake, uh, hold still and lay down on a plate and put a, <laughs> and, and put a napkin. Put a, put a napkin in your hand. So what you're basically saying is that um, due to the increased uh, surge of competition of adding 2,000 dentists last three years, Australian dentists who used to be booked in advance are now finding that they have to start attracting new patients and start being more sophisticated on marketing because it's getting more competitive. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I'm not saying that's true with absolutely every dentist in the country, but it's... Um, you know, in addition to the um, the extra dentists coming onto the market, we've got uh, probably like the US, the increased corporatization. So there's more corporates popping up. I heard there was one, I think there's one in Australia that's actually publicly traded in Singapore, isn't there? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I guess what I hear about is from the dentists that I'm dealing with rather than the corporations themselves. Um, I have a feeling there's about three or four of them, uh, and they sit. I don't think it's it's not thousands of practices. It's like hundreds or perhaps a couple hundred nationally. Um, yeah, I, it'll come to me. I'm sorry, just drawing a blank there. Um, the third element is um, insurers, and I I feel like virtually every second in dentist I talk to, if you said to them, you know, what's concerning you about the industry. Uh, the insurers are actually opening their own dental practices as well and uh, I guess squeezing the dentists in terms of what they can charge for certain procedures. So it's a bit of an unholy trilogy as I like to call it, trinity I guess, in the sense of um, you know more dentists on the market, increased corporatization and then the, the pressure from these insurers. So, so, what, so when you're advising your clients at Dental Profit Systems, what will dentists find if they go to your website, uh, Dental Profit Systems? What are, what are you doing for uh, just, dentists just in to, Australia? Just to clarify how a dental profit system. Oh, um, what, did I, what did I say? Yeah, no extra S on the end. Not systems, system. Okay, Dental Profit System. So yep. if, if the dentists go to Dental Profit System or email you thrive at Dental Profit System, what are they going to find on your website? What are you doing for your clients? Um, look, we've tended to take a bit of a back to basics program. To be quite honest with you, a couple of years ago, we would have been much more about the digital space and getting out there with Google AdWords. And at that time, that seemed like it was kind of the bee's knees. And for some clients, it still works pretty well. But we do find the results with that a bit patchy nationally, and I think that's because, I mean, the reality is it's just more competitive than it's ever been. When you are paying five or ten cents a lead, then if one in a hundred clients called you, well, that was okay. But when you're paying ten bucks uh, just for for a click, uh, and then you're hoping to get ten or fifteen percent of people to click, it starts getting rather expensive. So. Um, I guess the system that we're running at the moment is um, it's a six month quick start program and uh, it's real back to basic stuff. We'll start with calculating average patient value. Most clients I speak to don't know that, uh, how much someone spends with you in a one year period and then I guess you can uh, you know, escalate that out into subsequent years. Uh, we'll capture the core referral sources. One of the, we did some market research earlier this year, Howard, and um, one of the biggest gripes from dentists and probably from business people universally is they go, well, we spend money on marketing, but we don't actually know what works and what doesn't. Um, and so we set up systems so that they're capturing that at the time of the call. Uh, we'll measure the call conversion, you know, how many calls are being actually turned into appointments. Most practices I've spoken to don't seem to know that. 
Um, then we look at building their online presence, um, the online reviews, getting their business, Google business profile, um, and then really optimizing or setting up patient referral systems. Most dental practices I speak to have got a system in place, but it's not optimized. They're not measuring, they don't know what results they're getting. And then, and then finally, um, we're having some good success with setting up business referral systems where, uh, you know, a local, other people in the healthcare space, whether that's, a, you know, a doctor or a physio or maybe even a gym or a, um, you know, Pilates or whatever else. So setting up kind of uh, reciprocal arrangements with those kind of businesses. What is a physio? Uh, a, physio, a physical therapist. Oh, I'm physical sorry. therapist, okay. Yeah. Interestingly, we call them physiotherapists. You call them physical therapists. Just one of those things. You know what? It, it really um, it really needs to go back to basis because the bottom line is um, marketing, I have always felt, has been a very bad drug to get on because when you, when you do the math, um, it takes, in the United States, it takes three new patient opportunities to call your office before your receptionist can convert one to schedule to come in. And you need right. three people to come in with just, I'm just talking to cavity, not fancy implants, veneers, bleaching, bonding, and that. It takes three people to come in with a cavity for you to treatment plan acceptance to get one person to pay you money to drill, fill, and bill. So they need nine people to call the phone for every filling they do. And then after that filling is done, um, and they uh, forget to they schedule them for a cleaning, but they for, forget to schedule the recall. Say say they forget twenty to schedule twenty percent for a recall. Now twenty percent are gone. Uh, someone cancels or doesn't show. They never call them back. Uh, someone said, "Well, I got to go to work and check my schedule." No one followed up. So by the time the average American gets to five thousand charts, only one thousand have been in the last twenty four months. So the back door is propped open eighty percent of people just flying out. And the front door takes nine people to call to get one filling. So solving that complete disaster would just saying, oh, let's just do a ton of marketing and get a billboard and Google ads and do all that stuff. You, you, so you're absolutely right. You got to get back to basics. Yeah. And I, I think, Howard, what I find is, and I, this is understandable, but often if I have a new client call me, you know, nine times out of ten, what they want me to do is be Angus who produces the silver bullet. Um, and yet my experience has been with the practice that we've worked with over a number of years, those that have done best have been those that have um, worked across a number of layers consecutively. And that's why I mentioned those six steps that we do in this six-month fast-track program. It's those who are um, you know, they've got their referral system optimized and they're boosting their reviews and they're checking their call conversions and they know what their numbers are and et cetera, et cetera. And it's really that compounding effect uh, of all those things that those are the ones I see getting the best returns. If the practices are just kind of, oh, can you just, you know, what's the latest bit of social media? We need to be on that space and spend as much money as possible. In my experience, that's not really generating the results. So how much is uh, your program? This is Dentistry and Sensory. How much, how much is your six-month uh, program? Um, so that's uh, $39.95. Um, and we, um, it's a, a kind of a partnership program in the sense that we will work with the clients to um, take through this stuff. We end up doing quite a lot of stuff together. There's a monthly call. Um, you know, I, I get on the the Zoom or the Skype with people or face-to-face, -face, depending on where they are, and we work through this stuff together. And, um, you know, the, the early indications are very positive. So thirty-five ninety-five. what is that in U.S. dollars? What, what, what's the Australian dollar and the U.S. dollar? What, what's the uh, trade at now? Um, an excellent question. I have a feeling it's around 75 cents. Uh, so... Um, so so four thousand down down under would be about a uh, six thousand or or about a uh, fifty five hundred. No, the other way. So in other words, it's even cheaper. Uh, in fact, Australia is a great place to come for a vacation at the moment, Howard. If you're in the US, 
you're uh, you're getting, I suppose, an extra twenty percent on every dollar you spend. Nice, nice, nice. Um, I, I love Australia. I, I'm so glad my brother moved down there. It's Sydney, Australia is the only city. I, I've lectured there probably every five years for 25 years. It's the only city I, every time you fly back, you always think, why am I going, why am I leaving? <laughs> I mean, my it brother, is, my brother my, moved to Sydney and he was going to uh, do this job. Uh, he took a job for three years and six weeks after he was there, he applied for citizenship. Wow. Well, I mean, he, I mean, we grew up in Kansas. You can't go from Kansas to Sydney and then decide it's a good idea to go back. I mean, maybe if you're from San Francisco or Vancouver, British Columbia, maybe there or San Diego, but you can't go, you can't go from Kansas to Sydney. I mean, I mean, it's amazing. He hasn't even bought a car yet. I mean, the subway. I mean, I, I'm so jealous. I mean, you, you, you walk out his front door in every block, restaurants, bars, shops, restaurants, bars, subway. Um, you know, if I went out my house and went and laid down on the middle of the street, no one would probably see me for three days. I mean, it is so boring. <laughs> I mean, it is. The suburbs of America are so boring. And, I, get, uh, I guess it depends what you want. Um, I must admit I live in the suburbs. I've only been in Sydney about five years. And uh, it's funny, I, I did most of my schooling in Canberra, which is about two and a half hours away. And I probably grew up with a little bit of a kind of a cringe, a cultural cringe over Sydney. But having lived here, I go, this is one of the world's great cities. And even now, we still behave like tourists. You know, we'll go in and see the harbour and so on. It's, it's yeah, it is an amazing and, and, and the other world's greatest cities, like, uh, say, London or Copenhagen or, or Stockholm, hell, they're, they're, you, you think you're in, in Antarctica half the year. I mean... My yeah. God, if you people are, get all excited, they're going to London. I'm like, dude, you're going there in January. You're going to yeah. wish you were never born for your entire trip. Uh, but but Sydney, I mean, it's tropical. I mean, on top of on top of a perfect city, it has perfect weather. The weather is really great. Um, I, I lived in northern Virginia for a while, um, which had uh, very cold winters and then Canberra, pretty cold winters. But like. I'm talking to you in the morning here. So this is the middle of winter and it'd be, I need to do the conversion. It's like 17 degrees Celsius, which I think is maybe high 60s, low 70s, maybe even a little more. Um, I've been for a run this morning. It's, yeah, no, the winter here is amazing. Um, so what? how do you calculate the average uh, patient value? You, you, you said you calculate the value for one year? Yeah, yeah. So how, um, how do you calculate that? So what we'll do is we'll get um, clients to uh, run a report over the past 12 months of sp expenditure per patient and sort that list from high to low. Uh, and say, for example, if you've got a 1,000 patients who spent some money with you in the last 12 months, then you go and find out what's the what amount did patient number 500 on that list spend. So look more accurately, it's actually median patient value, but it's just it's a proxy for saying because I think a lot of a lot of clients it's quite an eye opener to them. They've never done this before. It's never occurred to them that maybe it's okay to spend 20 or 50 bucks to get someone to come in because you know on average. They're going to spend with you. For most of my clients, they'd be in the range between five hundred and a thousand dollars in the first year, and then they can look at their own data and say, "Well, on average, they're going to stick with us for three, four, five years." So it's it's worth the investment. Yeah, you know, um, any business you talk to, I mean, any business, it could be an air conditioner, or whatever. They all know how much money it costs to acquire a new customer. And they know what their average customer spends until you go into healthcare and government. And uh, I mean, a hospital can't even tell you what their uh, daily costs are. I mean, I mean, uh, uh, healthcare and government is the two most inefficient industries I've ever seen in my life. They're the, uh, like, like um, most free enterprise redid all their computer systems before Y2K. Remember Y2K, the year 2000? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I everybody updated and used that time to go digital. And here it is 2017, and the government is still completely on paper. I mean, they, they didn't even start the digitalization paper. Um, you know, hospitals, if you pass out at a restaurant in Phoenix, 
when the ambulance picks you up, they won't know your name. They won't know what prescriptions you're on. They won't know what doctors you're going to. I mean, you know, that, that they, there's something like 4,000 different major um, physician practice management information systems. You know, it, I mean, it, it, it is beyond completely insane. And then they want to know why it costs so much when everybody with an MBA says that 30% of your entire health care costs is just paperwork. Wow. And, and, the, and they don't get it. So then the dentist... Um, the dentist will say, well, I don't want to spend a hundred dollars a week on Google ads. And it's like, well, dude, you, you know, you get one patient that gets an implant and a crown for $3,000. Tell, tell, tell me, tell me why you don't want to spend a hundred, but they, they don't, they don't look at anything like a business. They won't call a new patient, a customer. Uh, they won't, they won't, they say they don't sell dentistry. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a very cultural, uh, rift. Uh, government and healthcare. Well, I think Howard, I I've, I've been thinking about this lately, and I've um, I've coined the term entre dentist. Uh, I know, which is, I like that entre dentist. Yeah, I just I think that I mean the, those those macroeconomic factors that we've talked about, the competition and the insurers and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, I just think that the the dentist now cannot afford to just go, well, I'm just a dentist and I like drilling teeth and, you know, everything else is going to take care of itself. And, and that was true in years gone by, but in most places that's just not the case now. So, um, you know, forget the silver bullet. Uh, you've got to embrace your inner entrepreneur and, and probably get some help. Go back to basics, just do them really well and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's definitely doable, but... Um, Thinking you can just hang out your shingle and everything will take care of itself is unfortunately just not the case anymore in most places. And another thing, when you say there's uh, approximately 25 million people with approximately 20,000 dentists or approximately 1,250 dentists, um, um, 1,250 patients per dentist, that really can be data mined forever because having been to Australia, most all your people live in the big cities of uh, Melbourne, Sydney, Adelaide, Brisbane, Perth. Um, I'm sure an hour outside of any of those towns, there's probably areas that have a shortage of dentists. I'm sure all those dentists want to practice in downtown Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Perth. And then when you go into the most crowded areas of Sydney and you start data mining the fact that there's 168 hours in a week, I bet almost all of those dentists uh, work in a very short time period. Of, uh, you know, The average dentist in America is Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. Well, that's only 32 hours. That's only 19% of the week. Like in Phoenix, Arizona, you know, if you got a toothache on Sunday, you're out of luck. And there's 3.8 million people here in the metro. Uh, on, on Sundays, you need to break your leg because the hospitals are open on Sunday. An ambulance will pick you up, take you to the hospital. But if you break your tooth on a Sunday, you're more likely to be killed by a UFO and kidnapped by a unicorn than find a dentist open. So... When those young dentists are data mining the hours of consumer availability, of access and availability, you can find some gaping holes in those metros. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of the other things we've started doing as part of this kind of measuring process is um, at the moment it's in, we're using it in Excel and then we're actually just taking it online currently. Um, we're actually feeding back to the dentists what uh, time of day they're receiving their calls, what day of the week they're doing that, and then we're aggregating it. We've got a bunch of dentists doing this at the same time. Uh, and it's exactly as you say, most of them are, all the calls are between Monday and Friday and in this fairly narrow window. I, I tell you the one that I've wondered about, and this is um, this is going a little bit out there, but are you aware of anyone in the US who's doing let's say an initial consult um, by Skype or by, you know, something like that. Have you? Um... I have not heard that, but I do. Um, a lot of times when I'm talking to a patient, especially a man, you know, a third of the divorce is over money. Um, a third are over uh, substance abuse and a third are over uh, sex. So when you start talking money, I always tell my team, if it's a man and he's got an iPhone, FaceTime his spouse. So, you know, he doesn't want to sign up for a thousand dollars of dental work and get in trouble from his wife. And um, I'm excited that um, Microsoft, um, they bought Skype 
Yeah. And now they bought LinkedIn. So I'm hoping if you have an Android, when you pull up someone's page on LinkedIn, hopefully within a year or so, there'll be a button and then it'll be a VoIP call, voice over internet protocol, FaceTime call. But yeah, I think that, um, um, I, and, I, I, and I think it's crazy that like on 911, typical government, 911, you're at an emergency. So you call 911 on your phone. You can't uh, take a picture and text it to them. You can't text 911. You can't on iPhone just sit there and show the, the lady, here's the car wreck. She's like, oh, what is the color of the car? Why are you asking me the color of the car? If I call my mom, she's 80. I could show my 80-year-old mom the car, but I can't show 911 the car. Does that make any sense to you? So, yeah, I, yeah, I think uh, any way that you can talk to an incoming caller, uh, it, that, is, that is, of course, if you're attractive. My mom told me I have a face for radio, and she told me uh, never to go on TV or YouTube. But, yeah, I think um, you get so much better communication if you can see the person. That's why I like to do um, Skype. I actually prefer the interviewer to come by my home. I feel like I have the most chemistry interview there. Second is on Skype, but I, I don't want to do it on the phone. And I think um, and when when we started doing podcasts, most of the big views were it started off as an iTunes play. But since it was video, now some of those um, some of those views on video, like we interviewed uh, Carl Mish, and there was one hundred ninety five thousand views on that thing just on Facebook because I think people wanted to see Carl. They really right. wanted to see Carl. They didn't want to listen to him. Even though it was successful on iTunes, uh, but yeah, I think I think an incoming video call would be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, it's just it's just one of the things uh, I'm I'm sort of you know you're trying to always think ahead of the curve. What what's what's coming next? But anyway, for for most of the dentists, as I say, this idea of entre dentist, I think that's probably what I'd like to see them embracing a bit more. Um, of course, they've got to be excellent technicians, and I'm. I really, literally, take my hat off to the dentists in terms of the amount of ongoing professional development they do in that technical space. But I'd, I'd probably like to see them do a bit more in the um, kind of business and marketing space as well. Yeah. So, what type of what software are you using to measure incoming calls? I mean, what 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 are you actually doing on on the on the front door? Um, so we've got. Do you have one three hundred numbers in the US? Um, you got, you've got one eight hundred numbers. We have we have one eight hundred number. Do we? He said, do we have one three hundred numbers? And we have one 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 eight hundred numbers are free. One eight eight are free, and one nine hundred are the ones that cost. Right. Yeah, I think okay. I think I think one nine hundred numbers cost by the minute. Yeah, so the a one eight hundred number in Australia is free, and a one three hundred number is for the cost of a local call. I don't, frankly, I don't know why they bothered, but anyway. Um, and so, um, with one of the firms that we're using here, anything that comes through that, um, the call can be recorded, and you can pull off any of the metrics that you want there. So, so you, you, don't, can, you you don't know the name of the software. Uh, no, look. There's a range of companies that provide this. We've got a we've got a business arrangement with one of them, but it's not it's not difficult to set up in a sense. Uh, and you can have that one three hundred number routed to any number you want, including a cell phone if you wanted. I also think it's just human behavior. I mean, there's a ton of research that if you put a camera above a cash register, the stealing and embezzlement and the internal control over peculation just plummets. Just the fact that when they know you're recording the phone call. Uh, they're they're on Broadway. I mean, if if you think your dentist is back there doing a root canal and has no idea what's going on, you can get lazy and you know, hello. But if you yeah. know you're being recorded, it's thank you for calling today's dental. Yeah. This is Valerie. How may I help you? You know, it's interesting you say that, Howard. I I called ten dentists in ten minutes uh, earlier this year. I was doing some work with a specialist, and it was just something we needed to do. And it was really shocking to me because after 10 minutes, I went, wow, there are three distinct buckets in my mind having spent not more than one minute on the phone with each of these dentists. There was a one bucket where I went, these guys are awesome. I'd, I'd be very happy to be a client of them. There was another bucket which was like, you know, kind of tick the box but not much more. And then there was a third bucket. And literally from a one-minute call, I went, 
my goodness, I never ever want to deal with them. I would never go as a patient. Uh, and that's on the basis of a one minute phone call. So they could have world class marketing, you know, with a world's best website and, you know, maybe they could have endorsements by Hugh Jackman or God knows whoever else. And yet when they picked up the phone, they were able to elevate or kill the thing in one minute. Yeah, and that's why I tell marketing companies, I mean, uh, you, you, if a dentist spends a bunch of money on marketing and he has a, um, a horrible um, incoming call center, uh, my God, he's going to blame the marketing. He's never going to, he's never going to blame his favorite little buddy up front who brings him a Starbucks coffee and a donut every morning. She's perfect. And if, yeah. if you don't, if you don't start measuring that stuff and say, okay, I served you ninety incoming calls, and you only converted nine of them into appointments. Yeah. So, and then, so what do you want to do? You want to double your marketing expenditure? And that's what's tough in dentistry because the dentist has eight, 10, 12 years of college. The hygienist has four years of college. The dental assistant went to school for a year, but the receptionist is, was uh, just, you know, she just no zero training. And then when you, when you go get a, a new job at McDonald's, um, you'll have to do eight, 10, 12 online hours of education and then you go get a job in a dental office or a hospital receptionist. Um, you, there's no training. You, you just start yep. and you just walk in there and start answering the phone. Well, it, I, I wrote an article um, for one of the Australian magazines recently, which was called slightly flippantly, the fastest way to kill your dental marketing. Uh, and it, I mean, it just talked about literally just picking up the phone. Um, I was sitting in a, practice waiting to talk to the principal and um, I have a and this was a really good practice and I think the girl was fairly new and she was she, I thought she was doing the right thing she was ringing around saying hi it's Mary calling from ABC Dental just confirming your appointment for you know tomorrow or Tuesday or whatever and and then she said I think she said something like just confirming you don't want to cancel. And I was like, no. I mean, I don't know. It was, you know, literally, what, six or eight words that came out of her mouth. But can you imagine the impact on the conversion rate of that, the cancellation rate? And then you'll say to a dentist, and, you know, they're adorable. I mean, anybody goes to college eight years to perform surgery with their hands on you in an operatory trying to get you out of pain. They're, they're not, they're not. You know, they're not like they're lawyers or, you know, um, you know, investment bankers who have no problem buying a factory and laying off all the workers and closing it down because the real estate is worth more than the factory. And, and they, they can do that without even a thought. Um, but when they sit there and you say, well, you know, maybe you should charge a twenty five dollar cancellation fee if they cancel within twenty four hours. Oh, you know, no, I, I, I don't I don't feel that would be good. And I say, OK, well, now I want you to tell me what does an operatory cost you for an hour? So that hygienist who had an appointment, they, they canceled that morning. What does that operatory cost you? What is your rent, mortgage, equipment, bill, that computer, insurance, small practice, professional dues, and the hygienist labor? What is all that divided by one unit of operatory hour? And they say, well, I have no idea. And I say, isn't it easy to be so nice with other people's money? Because obviously your money comes from the tooth fairy because uh, you, you, don't, you don't even know what, what you're losing. And then when you, then when you do the math, and you spend all that time and you say, okay, your hygienist, her room cost $110 an hour. And over the last three years, she's averaged $95 an hour of billing. So you've lost $15 US every hour she has worked for three years. And you're the nice guy who doesn't want to charge a patient a $25 cancellation fee. And then when you explain that to the hygienist, that I've lost $15 every hour you've ever worked for me. Her next word out of her mouth is, well, um, the earth just went around the sun again and made a complete revolution. So I need another dollar an hour because my raise is based on the Zodiac. Right, right. I mean, I mean, <laughs> it, I mean you, the more you dig into dentistry, you don't know whether to laugh or cry during the business of dentistry. Look, I guess, uh, Howard, you're a dentist, so you can, you know, you can probably get away with, um, are you familiar with the Australian term sledging? Sledging? I think you, 
Yeah, is that, you, you would... is that how you apply Vegemite on a sandwich with a sledge? <laughs> no, I think you would say dissing in the US. Uh, in Australia, it started in the sporting field. They talked about sledging, and um, so I, you know, if you pardon a bit of Australianism, you're yeah. a dentist, so you can sledge dentists a little more freely than I can. I don't. That's not my role. Um, I, I take the view that. Uh, you know, I mean, you don't know what you don't know. And so I guess the dentists are trying to do their thing. But um, so, yes, I, I'm going to be bit, I'm going to be a bit more diplomatic than you, Howard. <laughs> I don't I, you know, it's just it's just the way I started. It was in 1990 and I gave my first lecture and they all said, uh, uh, dude, you you pissed off half the people and you, you can't do that. And, I, and I've always said the same thing. I always said, this is how my dad and I talk to each other. That's how me and my boys talk to each other. And for me, my world, if I love you and respect you. I'm totally going to tell you what I think. Yeah. And if I'm afraid of you and fear and dysfunctional, I'll hold back. So I always go into a relationship with open love, call you on your own shit, and just, you know, throw throw you under a bus if it's deservingly. And, yeah, you know, no, and, and, and if they come back to me, they I, say, they, and whatever. But um, when we go to lunch, by the way, back to Vegemite, um, I've never <sighs> eaten kangaroo. I've been to, I've been oh, to, okay. we, do we they eat kangaroo? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can get it in the supermarkets quite easily. Um, is it good? It's, I mean, it's okay. I, it's, would, it's, would it taste better with Vegemite on it? Possibly, possibly. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's a uh, chef somewhere that's come up with a kind of a Vegemite marinade or crust or something. Um, I'll tell you what. It's, the, it's a bit like beef, to be the honest. Thing, the bit. thing about, you know, the funniest thing is when I went to China, First time I was in there, uh, um, pretty deep into Shenzhen, and um, spe I was speaking to the, the um, world, world, modern, modern dental world conference, something like that. And you know, you can't find a single American who could, to today, could tell you the name of the prime minister or the the the, the leader of China. I mean, right. you 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 couldn't. Be, I I know of no one, and I never have. And then you go back over there, five thousand year civilization. You, you know, the, so the Americans don't know the name of any of those guys. Well, I found the same true in China. I mean, they got a billion, 300 million people. Uh, I, I didn't meet any dentist who could tell me the name of the president of the United States, knew who George Washington was, any more than any dentist here could tell you who was in the Ming Dynasty or the Dynasty. But I would ask them, I'd say, well, when I say the United States of America, what do you think about? And they would only name things you could eat. They'd say Hershey's, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and it was funny because it, for Australia, I mean, if you're an American and you say, what do you think about when you're Australian? You think of the Bee Gees, you think of Men at Work, you think of uh, all the all these music. I mean, it seems like you guys have exported more major music. Uh, only you and, and London have exported massive amounts of music to the United States. And quite a few actors, too. I think, um, you know, for better or worse, a Mel lot of us... Sorry? Mel Gibson? <laughs> Wasn't he yes. born in Australia? I think so. He certainly grew up in Australia. You, you never know. I mean, Nicole Kidman, um, Hugh Jackman, Chris Hemsworth. Uh, who was the guy who was the Incredible Hulk? Eric Banner. Who uh, was and the, the guy in Gladiator? Uh, Russell Crowe. We call him Australian. He's actually born in New Zealand. Um, you know, if they're, if they're close uh, if, enough, close enough. You got to give a partial enough, exactly, on that one. Exactly. Yes, that's our extra. State. But you'll never uh, guess what my favorite city in Australia is. Uh, okay, I won't. Perth. Okay. Oh my God! So, so if you're an American, so so Melbourne and Sydney would be like, um, say, uh, Miami so, and uh, New York City, something like that. Would you say that? Yeah, probably South Carolina uh, okay. and Miami, yeah. So Perth would be clear on the other side, yeah, like by Seattle, um, touching the closest to Antarctica, the South Pole, Antarctica. It'd be more like where LA is. Yeah, because of the South Pole. It's and my God, so it's a, it's a five-hour so, flight. What's that? It's so isolated. It must be the most isolated city in the world. Well, it's a, it's a 15 hour flight to, to Australia. I mean, Australia is isolated to begin with, but now you're flying all the way to the other side by Antarctica. So every single thing is unique. The buildings, the tables, the 
the culture, the accents, the food, the bars. I mean, it's just, it's, in, it's like in a whole different world. It's like a parallel universe of coolness. Yeah, no, I mean, look, it is a beautiful city. I quite like it. But even for Australia, which I grant you is can seem a bit isolated itself, um, even within Australia we go, Perth's fine, but it's so flipping isolated. It's like you don't – nobody drives to Perth. It would be – I think it's three or four days' drive from Sydney to Perth. Um, you've got to fly there. How – can I ask you um, – the cancellation fee that you raised, I'm just interested to know from your experience uh, of dentists that have actually kind of um, taken the bull by the horns and done that and what the impact has been. Well, what the impact is, is very, very simple. So when you look, when you go to McDonald's, and by the way, um, the fastest way to be a multimillionaire in Australia, you guys still don't have Mexican food. Uh, it's coming. It's actually it's here now. You don't even have a Chipotle's. No, but we've got. You don't have a Taco Bell. No, but we've got uh, two or three new ones that just oh popped up. Oh my god! The first guy that rolls out Chipotle franchises are Taco Bell, or you could even get a second rate one like uh, out of cans. They have Taco Tico. But I mean, my brother lives down there. When he comes back, we only eat Mexican food breakfast, lunch, and dinner because he said you absolutely can't find it. And I mean, I think Sydney and Melbourne could each hold at least 50 Mexican restaurants each. And I mean, that, those, things, those, They're things would, now. those things would do three million a year and you'd net a million. I mean, I mean, my brother, I, I even tell him, why are you still working for the university? Just quit and get a Chipotle franchise. And if you can't get a Chipotle, I wouldn't even get a Chipotle franchise. I mean, I would just get a Mexican family from Phoenix to move down there. Uh, but um, back, back to the, you go into McDonald's, you order, you pay, and then they give you the food. You go into a dental office, you order the food, they do the root canal and crown, and then when you're leaving, they try to collect the money. And with humans, most everybody's above board. Only 5% consistently try not to pay their bills. So if you don't collect, 5% of your money, and the average dentist in America has two-thirds overhead, so they have 65% overhead, and they're netting a 35% if you include the cost of the dentist and the profit dollars. Um, so 5%, if you don't collect 5%, you still had to produce that dentistry, which is 10%. So virtually 15% of this doctor's overhead is because he doesn't collect 5% of the money. It's the same thing with no-shows and cancellations. Like, I'm old school. I mean, for me, I'm late if I'm not at my appointment five minutes early. Uh, I mean, I would never consider going to a meeting at work, a doctor. I would never be late. I mean, for me, it'd be late if I walked in right and I was supposed to be there. Same thing with humans. It's about 5%. Then when they make an appointment, they're like, yeah, I'll make an appointment. Because in their undisciplined mind, they always know at the last minute if they just decide that they don't want to do it because they're just that way. So weeding out the 5% that aren't going to pay by saying, no, you order crown, you give me $1,000, and then we do the crown. And they say, well, I don't get paid till Friday. Well, great, let's go up front and find an appointment sometime on Friday after you get paid. And they, and they say, well, we take credit cards. Well, well, I don't have a credit card. Well, that's funny because America will give every 10-year-old a credit card on their 10th birthday and then send them an application for a new one every month until he dies at 100. So why would Chase and Bank of America, why would all the multinational banks not give you a credit card? Probably because you're a complete financial idiot. Um, so, so by weeding out 5% of the people that aren't gonna pay, you get rid of 15% of your overhead, the 5% they didn't pay, and the 10% of overhead for the cost of goods that are sold. And by saying, by the way, um, for that appointment, if you cancel within 24 hours, uh, we'll have to ding your credit card for $25. So um, I don't have your credit card on file. So why don't you give me your credit card number? And uh, and if they're like, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give you a credit card. I mean, if anybody asked that to me or you or my kids or everybody I hang around with, you would get it. You would right. totally get it. But the person's right. like, well, I don't. I don't want to give you my credit card number. Yeah, because probably you don't even know if you'll show up. So right. we, so, and that's another thing that young dentists do. When a crazy person comes in, 
I mean, batshit crazy. They they think they have to treat them. And then and then when a lawsuit comes out and you start reading the charts about this completely irrational nut job, it's like, you know, you just have to realize that five percent of the people in any country are crazy. And you gotta have policies to protect yourself from crazy. Paid pay to play. Pay me, we'll play. Pay to play, no pay, no play. I gotta have a credit card. If you don't have a credit card, you need to be in public health. You know, and, or start brushing and flossing your teeth every morning and every night and quit uh, drinking Pepsi for breakfast. Uh, mm. So, yeah, so a lot of those policies are just aimed at weeding out the 5%. Yeah, yeah. Okay, oh, look, it's not, uh, I mean, you know, as a marketer, frankly, we are focusing more on the front end, but it's something that I've heard talked about and it just I was just curious to see what your experience had been with that policy. And, and then for the back door, I mean... The back door at the end of the day, I'll say to the dentist, I'll say, uh, so how was your day? And he says, good, I did I did two root canals and 12 fillings. And I'll say, yeah, how many, how many how many cleanings did your hygienist do? And they go, well, I had two hygienists and they each cleaned eight. And so they did 16. And I'll say, and what percent of those were rescheduled for the next appointment? No idea. And I'll say, so right. so at the end of the day, why, why was your hygienist allowed to go home um, if she didn't, uh, call and, um, you know, and reschedule appointments, um, uh, when the hygienist says, I don't want to, um, schedule my appointments, I'll have the front desk lady do that. That's because she's not a closer. She right. knows that her service is so bad and she's just the type of personality that she, she doesn't have the guts to say, Hey, Angus, after an hour of all this, you want to do it again in three, four, six months. Oh, hell no. She wants to push that off front. So right. you're like, no, no, hygienist, you're going to close. And, and, and if I have two hygienists in an eight-hour day, one can get seven out of eight to reschedule in three, four, six months, and the other one can only get four out of eight, then we have, we have a measurement that we need to focus on. Yeah, absolutely. But, it, but, it, but a dentist just, they just, they, um, what I find with dentists is that if their mom and dad own their own business of any sort, it could have been, a wheat farm, a dairy farm, a restaurant. It, it could have been a tailor shop, a shoe shop. If their mom and dad own their own, usually it's a dental office. Right. It's about, about 25, 30% of the Americans, uh, they, got, they got a family member in dental. If their parents own their own business, they get it. But by God, if, they're, if their mom and dad both work for the post office, uh, you, know, you should almost tell them you should just go to corporate dentistry now and save yourself a lot of grief. Because this is going to be a long road. It, it'll almost be like taking uh, uh, a Catholic and trying to turn him into Buddhist or something or Confucius. I mean, it's just a, a religion of I'm an entitled employee from Cato to Grave to right. I've really got to work this business. I mean, it, it's a complete cultural shock to him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, I um, that's definitely something that we've seen. And. Uh, unfortunately, the head in the sand approach just doesn't work. I mean, uh, it. I, I think it's interesting. I, I get our clients tend to be either people who are relatively new in business or those where they go, uh, I'm not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy. You know, what, <laughs> what, what was working well a few years ago is not working. I've, I've, I'm not booked four weeks at, at an advance anymore. So, You know, I was born in Kansas. Well, there you go. Yeah, I was born in Wichita, Kansas. Love that place. Love it, love it, love it. The only thing I didn't like was the winters and the wind. I mean, uh, it's in the plains, so the wind is always blowing strong all day long from the north. In fact, in my entire childhood, the wind only stopped blowing one time, and everyone fell down. <laughs> I, I will say, as an Australian, I lived in the U.S. for several three years we lived in northern virginia and the one thing that really surprised me when we uh, were there is that when you go into the middle of the u.s people actually live there um, because in australia virtually nobody lives in the middle as you said before i mean i don't know what the figures are but i it'd be 90 80 90 percent of australians would live within one hour of the coast yeah well another interesting fact is did you know the united states Australia and China are all exactly the same size at 3.6 million square miles. I knew Australia and the U.S. was around the same because I'm, I'm not and bad. China. At, uh, and I didn't so, know that China. So those three countries are all the same size and basically almost the same shape too. You got 20 million. We have 300 million and 20 million. 
And China has a billion, 300 million. So China has a billion people plus an entire United States. And the United States has 300 million plus an entire uh, Antarctica. I mean, uh, Australia. Spread. That's why That's why um, your prospects for growth are just amazing. I mean, just think yeah. of all the... Uh, just think of all the resources yet to be found and discovered. And I mean, I mean, you guys are on an easy 200, 300 year growth trajectory. Yes, yes. So I, I, look, at times Australia has been pretty dependent on mining um, and uh, shipping a lot of iron ore and such to China. Uh, so what do they used to say if... Um, you know, if America coughs, the rest of the world gets a cold. Uh, I'm starting to think Australia's relationship with China is probably more like that these days. Yeah, ab absolutely. Um, so when you're so back to the, um, you calculate the average patient value. You capture call referral services at the time of the calls, and you were talking about physicians, physios. Um, I've always had the most luck uh, from the pharmacist and the emergency rooms. Um, in the United States, the hospitals are bizarre. You can walk in there with a heart attack and they can do a heart transplant. You can walk in there with a tumor the size of a golf ball in your brain and then go in there and remove it. But you have a toothache and they look at you like you're from another planet, like you're a kangaroo. And so if you 8% of emergency room visits are a toothache, and so they just give everybody Vicodin, and pen vk and the same thing the pharmacist um i i take referral pads to every emergency room regularly within uh 10 15 minute drive and then but the pharmacists were actually the best because you would not believe pharmacists are just nice and they're mellow and they're not trying to sell you anything and people yeah. always walk up to them and say um what's the best for a toothache and they think they're going to say like ambisol or maybe Motrin's better, et cetera, or some deal better. And my pharmacist right in my same center, Brad, says, you know what you got to do? Here's Howard's card. Just call Howard. This is his cell phone. Here's his email, Howard at todaysdental.com. He's right around the corner. And the reason he calls Today's Dental is because if you're having an emergency, just, just go over there. And the reason I like that is because every dentist I know has a problem with no-shows and cancellations. So um, the pharmacist actually, for me, have always been the best. And here, here's another thing that's different in um, business industries. If you go into a business industry, they network their value chain. They go golfing on Saturday with their suppliers. Uh, they go out to dinner. Uh, my dad, I knew who sold my dad a million dollars of meat every year for nine Sonic drive-in restaurants. I mean, you, I mean, uh, anybody would, uh, uh, anybody would know in the family. And, you know, I, I think I, taken every pharmacist in my area of Ahwatukee to dinner at least three times in the last 30 years. I mean, they're your value chain. And yeah. dentists um, are entitled. Um, they're just, like I say, they're just like the government. Like, like they'll go in there and work eight to noon and their 11 o'clock will cancel and they'll do nothing. And then someone will call 1130 and they'll look at the afternoon and say, we don't have an opening. It's like, dude, you have a lunch hour. Nobody, in the, you know, why, why does that not even register the, the lunch hour? And, and they also don't even think of uh, networking or why would I, a dentist who's all that in a bag of chips, why would I go be nice to the pharmacist? They do it with their suppliers too. They treat, they treat the, the people from Henry Schein, the reps that come in there, they'll, they'll come in and stand at the counter for 20, 30 minutes. You treat those people like gold and then you find out your assistant moves and then you sit down with your with your supplier that you've treated like family your whole life and say who's who's the best dental assistant in the world and they'll give you three names and they mm. do that in sports you know mm. dentists they say well they get on dental time they say oh my god i can't believe the dentist cross street tried to hire my receptionist but then on another post he's talking about how his favorite football team or soccer team should be doubling the bad and so so they have a whole different set of rules but I think the most important thing is the staff needs to have their break-even point for the day. And what is their profit margin? If you're, and if you're a break-even point, if you, if you want a 50% overhead and you take all your bills divided by how many days a month you're open, you say, okay, well, if, if we're going to do 50% overhead, we got to come in here and do $2,500. And then we can go to lunch. And then we got to come back and do it again. But we're going to get to 5000 
And then your staff starts thinking, God, th throw a broken tooth in a lunch period because that lady at 2 o'clock, she canceled the last time. Or that, or, and, and then they start getting mad. They're saying, well, who scheduled her? That's the second time in a row or the third time in a row she didn't show up, and then we're not going to break even. But, but the entitled staff, they could be sitting there short $1,000 at 4 o'clock. And someone will call them at four o'clock and say, well, I, I broke my tooth. I could be there in an hour. And they go, sorry, the government closes at five. And it's like, well, where I, I, I've spent 30 years, like I, I would take that at five. And then I would rather go take the pharmacist uh, to dinner or a bar or whatever and, and talk with the value chain than go home and be an isolationist and watch sports, you know, alone at home, you know. Well, I think um, of all the healthcare professionals, probably the pharmacists are the most business-minded, maybe with the uh, exception of a, um, a plastic surgeon or something like that. But um, so, yeah, we've had really good success. And, you know, it's interesting. I, a lot of the dentists that I've talked about, hey, go and see local, you know, people that are sort of health-related in your area they're kind of nervous and they're thinking, oh, these people are going to think I'm crazy or whatever the case may be. But our experience has been they're by and large welcomed with open arms. As long as they're like, I mean, you imagine your business. If someone comes in and they are credible and they say, hey, why don't we work together and see if we can, you know, share clients and boost each other's business. He's like, yeah, of course. Um, so I, I actually went and saw one of the pharmacists with one of the clients because she was a bit nervous about the conversation. And... The pharmacist was like, right, yeah, this is fantastic. So glad you came in. Here are the top four things that I get asked about. Why don't you produce a brochure? Uh, and every time someone comes and asks me about, you know, bleeding gums or, you know, jaw pain or whatever, I'll just hand over your brochure and you can have your details at the bottom of it and, uh, you know, uh, let them know that we have appointments every day for emergencies. Yeah, you know, I, I think um, your value chain always... Um I think they love it when you're hungry, uh, not entitled. I think there's a far bigger resistance to that guy thinks he has an entitled mentality. They love humble, but how much, what percent of Sydney would say that the average physician and dentist is humble? They'd probably describe him as arrogant. So they like hungry, humble, and curious. They don't yeah. like entitled, arrogant, and, oh, I only have to, I have to take this continued education course because I need 18 hours to renew my license. Right, That's right. I mean, I mean, look at Thomas Edison. 10,000 attempts before he got a light bulb that worked. Henry Ford's first car company uh, went under. I mean, most of those people dive in the swimming pool and learn how to swim while they're drowning. And yeah. then they're, they're curious. And I've always noticed the dentists... Who take ah? Uh, that, and that's why I'm doing this podcast. I mean, this is why I do this podcast. It's free. I've noticed that the dentists who uh, took about a hundred hours of continuing education a year the last thirty years, all my friends that I've watched, they crushed it. They crushed it in happiness, rewarding, a career with purpose, um, leaders in their community, and and made bank. And the ones who only took the minimum hours of continued education, they didn't learn any new techniques. They didn't learn any new. They didn't learn Invisalign, root canals. They didn't learn anything. And so much of that stuff I learned and did a lot of it, but realized that it wasn't going to be a good fit or I didn't like it. Um, or like, 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 like dentists will do Invisalign, but the orthodontist is flipping those patients in 15-minute increments. And right. then you're doing Invisalign and you're scheduling 30 minutes for the appointment. And then I say, hey, dude, what do you think the orthodontist overhead is? Okay, it's 60%. And you're doing twice as long. So, and your overhead's higher than him. So how, how are you making any money? Okay, if, if the orthodontist is charging $6,500 and that's a 15-minute appointment and he's got 60% overhead and you've got 65% overhead and you're scheduling 30-minute appointments, you can't do Invisalign. You either got, and that's another thing we found that if you don't do a procedure every week, you never get... Faster, easier, higher quality, lower costs, and make bank on it. If you're only doing an Invisalign check once a month or twice a month or whatever, um, you're, you're, you're losing money, um, which is okay if it's your passion. But I do. I was definitely, and I assume that's a phenomenon in the U.S. because it certainly is in Australia. I see it among my clients. They go, oh, in fact, many of them 
as I say, I take my hat off to them. They're so uh, keen and constantly on courses, but it'll be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a such and such braces course this weekend and then you know help help me market it angus which is i'm very happy to do um but then i i often find you sort of six months down the track they've they've just not done them whether they've not found the cases or whatever the case may be but it um it's like if there's a problem with my business let's go and do a new technical course um you know because that'll solve everything whereas as as we've been talking about how from my point of view uh, what excites me is getting clients' business to grow, uh, and for that, that means doing the basics and doing them well. And what is your definition of an entre-dentist? I love that, E-N-T-R-E, entrepreneur and dentist equals an entre-dentist. What's your definition of an entre-dentist? So my definition, I guess it's just about recognizing the fact that they, and I don't know what the percentage is, but let's say they've got to be half entrepreneur and half dentist. and most dentists in my experience are all over the dentistry side they do lots of continuing education they're great dentists but the relationship between being a good technical dentist and having good business is the worst it's ever been um it's you know apart from the fact that most of your patients can't tell how strong you your dental skills are so yeah for me it's like a, it's kind of a mindset it's a philosophy that says I need to be half business guy and half dentist. So you have a, uh, it's called Marketing Monday. Is that a podcast? Uh, it's a, it's a, I'm doing it by video. It's on Facebook Live and then it goes out by email as well. Haven't been doing it on a podcast yet. You haven't, you haven't put a, um, so you're doing it on Facebook Live. Yeah. And then what else do you do with it? Then you. And then it, and then it gets onto the website and I've got a mailing list and it gets emailed out as well. So what, you email a link to your Facebook Live? Yeah, so with the, the video, um, uh, when you finish the Facebook Live, there's a button you can press on your phone and it captures the video and then that gets uploaded. Um, I mean, I've, I've got a, a video editor, so we put an intro and so on, but that's essentially what it is. Huh. So are you thinking about putting it on YouTube or iTunes? It's on YouTube. It's not on iTunes. Um, yeah, look, it's, uh, it's that's definitely all part of the plan. I think one of the things that happened for our business, Howard, is we, as I alluded to initially, we kind of started especially as digital marketers and then we realized that it was kind of only kind of working. So this, this six-month fast-track program that I've mentioned has been our real focus uh, in 2017. So yes, it's definitely on the list to expand that stuff, but um, we've been focusing mainly on the business model this year. So what um, what would be um, what would all the dentists listening find if they have um, if they went to Marketing Monday? Should they go to Marketing Monday? Uh, they'd find it on. Uh, out on the Dental Profit System Facebook page. Uh, otherwise, they can watch the videos afterwards on the dentalprofitsystem.com website. Um, look, it's a, uh, you know, it's basically a five minute, five, six, seven minutes um, where on a particular topic, uh, I don't know what the gap is between when you and I are recording this and when the show comes out, but uh, at the time of recording, um, i just done a four-part series looking at how to boost the marketing at your dental practice without spending an extra cent on your marketing. Uh, and a lot of that just outlines the stuff we've been talking about. Know your numbers. Know what the value of your people are. Know what your conversion rates are. I mean, really, it doesn't, it doesn't cost a cent to um, find out what portion of your callers are being converted into appointments, and yet... Goodness me, the potential financial return there is massive. One of the things that I love about your website, Dental Profit Systems, is what what 95% of all the dentists in the United States and Australia and Canada and Britain never do, and that is you put a YouTube video of you talking. How about that, eh? So here I am. I'm in Sydney, Australia, or Vancouver, British Columbia, and I'm afraid of the dentist, and I'm um, and I'm sitting here thinking, um, I, um, I'm afraid it's going to be expensive. Uh, it's going to hurt. And, and the next thing I know, 
I'm, I'm looking at these websites and it's, it's all these weird names like like Howard Ferran and, and there's like a, a mugshot picture of him. And then after I've seen like three dental videos, then I see someone sophisticated like you and there's a video. And the minute I started um, listening to your video, I mean, I mean, how could someone not like you uh, if they listen to uh, uh, your, your video? I mean, you're you're handsome, you're you're nice. I mean, I mean, you are. You, you don't look like um, you're going to hurt me. And, and, and if during the middle of a root canal, I say, um, you know, Angus, I'm here. I'm feeling that you don't. I mean, this guy doesn't look like he'd say, shut up and take it like a man. Uh, you know, like I'm going to be done in five minutes. And some of these, some of these, um, I, I mean, I just, I just think it's, um, I, I have to trust you. When I go, when I go to any, uh, when I go to McDonald's, I know what a Big Mac is. When I yeah. buy an iPhone, I know what it is. When I go to the dental office and Angus tells me that I need four cavities, well, I, I, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I, I'm not a dentist. And then yeah. I'm afraid, even if I have my entire body sleeve with tattoos from one million pinpricks, I'm absolutely paranoid about getting a shot in my mouth, even though I'm wearing a bone through my nose, four earrings, and I have a tattoo of a butterfly a foot and a half wide. So I got to trust you, and I'm afraid of you. And and the best way to nail that, like you, you said first out, has anybody started doing it with the incoming calls or video on Skype? And you said another one. What was it? A uh, loof or a Zoom? Zoom. I've never even heard of Zoom. Uh, but so, so yeah, you're talking about the incoming call should be on uh, Skype or Zoom. And I'm saying um, when I go to, when a dentist emails me, and I get about 300 emails a day to Howard at dentaltown.com, and I go back and I click that website to see who I'm talking to. I mean, the, the, the websites are lame. I would say seeing a video of a dentist in my space is maybe, what would you say, Ryan? Once, once a month? I yeah. see that once a month. And that's why I called you. You didn't call me. You probably never even, uh, um, I, I called you. And one of the things that made me say, I want to I wanna podcast this guy is because number one, you're in uh, a different market, Australia, and yeah. uh, Americans love anyone with an Australian accent, uh, especially if they're holding a foster beer. By the way, when you go to a bar in Australia and you order a foster beer, 80% of the beer bars don't even have one. No, 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 no. I, I, I can't tell you the last time I saw a Foster's. Like, yeah, well, if you I, live in America, you think you guys, all you do is, is uh, drink Foster's beer while eating kangaroo with Vegemite sandwich while listening to the Bee Gees. And and you live up the street from Russell Crowe, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I used to love that one. Uh, but anyway, uh, so so yeah, I, I I called you to be on my show because of uh, I felt like I met you on a YouTube video uh, on your website, and and every dentist should do that. Well, I do I do think we do do a fair bit of video production, and um, one interesting thing, Howard. In fact, like in the U.S. This is, you know, you could probably almost forget everything else I told you. If you are a dentist in the US, I'm begging you, get some video testimonials. In Australia, you can't do it. It's against the law um, for dentists to have testimonials of any description. Does that mean none of them ever do it? Yes, occasionally they do, and I guess they get found out eventually. But in the US, as far as I understand, there's no restriction. And um, I've coined the phrase um, two in one week, apparently. Um, if you say it, it's debatable. If they say it, it's saleable. And um, I just, you know, for someone who doesn't know your business at all, then to have an outsider, as long as it's not too cheesy, um, say, hey, I came to Dr. Ferran and he was really gentle and, you know, I had all these problems and he fixed it. I mean... That stuff is gold, and yet oh, so many people I see just don't do it. Yeah, and you know, and I got to tell you something for being old. I'm 54. These iPhone cameras and videos are a hundred times better than the most expensive equipment in the world when I was in high school and college. I mean, when I grew up, family films were these. Uh, I think they were what these little these these reels, these tapes, yeah, and yes, they'd always yes, break and splice, and and then you would take a picture of the camera. And then when you go develop the film, it'd be a roll of 12 or 24. At least 90% of all the pictures didn't come out right. 
and you're sitting there with a patient and you're about to hand her a mirror to show her her front tooth and what it's going to look like, your assistant should already have her iPhone in the hand, should already have the video and says, and can just say, can I, can I, can I shoot this when, when you, when you, uh, when you see, I want to, I want to, I want to capture the impression on your face. That iPhone picture is so quality and that video is so quality. And then you can upload that straight to Facebook. You can yeah. do, you can do it straight to YouTube. I mean, when you go to save that video, you can save it to YouTube. You can save it to a video. You can upload, you can do a Facebook live. I mean, there's so many ways. And, and that's another thing these dentists have to realize that. Uh, you come out of dental school, not only do you come out of dental school and you don't know the difference between a statement of cash flow, a balance sheet, and a statement of income, not only do you not know the difference between a return on asset and return on equity, not only only that, but you don't have camera skills. And when you're going into a website and, and you're selling cosmetic stuff, uh, tummy tucks, facelifts, boob jobs, veneers, implants, and you don't have any photo documentation of your own work, that is priceless. And if you don't want to do it, You've got two assistants, you've got a hygienist, you got two girls up front. Somebody in that office needs to learn how to photo document for your social media and website. And you need to do video. And the, one of the dentists that I think it loves the most, he goes, by the way, when you, when you call our office, the first person you're going to talk to is Valerie. And then, there's, and then Valerie comes in, yeah. hi, yeah. I hope you call me. And then when you come in, um, I'm actually not the one who's going to seat you and take your x-rays. That would be, you know, my, my girl, Jan. And Jan's like, come on in. It'll be fun. I'm going to take your picture. And when we take each one, it'll show up on the screen and I'll show it to you and tell you what's going on. By the time the doc comes in, you'll already know. You'll, you'll probably know more than he does because he's drunk. He's senile. Uh, he has uh, very different uh, degrees of dementia. And, and, they, and they, they feel like, yeah, I like that office. I trust yeah. Valerie. I trust Jan. I trust that dentist, and you can do that with video and picture. And you see these websites that say um, we're a cosmetic dentist. They don't even have a before and after picture. Yeah, yeah. But but the but the cosmetic dentists, the cosmetic surgeons in uh, in Phoenix that are doing all the boob jobs, face jobs, tummy tucks, eye lifts. You go to their website, and they have a dozen before and after of each one, and they have four or five YouTube videos of a of a lady sitting there and saying. Well, yeah, I came in here. I'm very happy. I was I was very nervous about doc getting this done, and and then and, and the doctor is only a small portion of how they made them feel. I mean, it's yeah. a whole team approach. And the the one thing that um, you know, because I'm aware that some Australian dentists will be listening to this, we can't do testimonials directly in Australia. But what's not a bad proxy is actually getting your staff to talk about the feedback that they get from clients. Um, so we, we did one of these recently where uh, they had the hygienist and she said, oh, you know, my name's Mandy or whatever, and I, I love working at uh, ABC Dental. Um, I really love it when the patients come in and they're a bit, you know, self-conscious and then we send them out and everything's great. And then proceeded to talk about two particular cases. And... Um, yeah, you, it's not, you know, the best, of course, is a direct testimonial, but you can actually have somebody talking about it and, and talking about the implications. I think the other thing that I see quite often, Howard, is um, where sometimes the dentists get the video out, they want to talk about the latest piece of technology or, you know, detail, 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 rather than what's the result for the patient? What's um, And this particular woman talked about a child who... She was at high school and there was something wrong with her teeth and she was really self-conscious and then they got some veneers and she said, we saw this girl later and it was like she was a new person. She was so much more confident. And that that's the result that you've got to focus on when you do that. Yeah, and the physicians never talk about that. The physicians are, come to my office. I got a brand new MRI. We've updated yeah. to the MRI plus plus super plus. And then, yeah. and, and then the lawyer, oh, yeah, we have every lawsuit in the world filed on our super duper rubber dub a dopa computer and we we will we will figure out everything in your lawsuit in one minute with our new you know i mean artificial intelligence i mean dentists are insane about that nobody gives a shit about your technology they I, I, I only just care about how you made them feel yeah and i'll tell you one last thing uh most of the dentists i know that the office has one million in revenue and they take home 350 
they're rural, they're usually two hours from a major airport, they don't do any fancy procedures, they don't do um, implants, bone grafts, sleep apnea, none of that stuff. They just got two or three hygienists that see someone every hour. And then out of those three hygienists, they pull out, you know, so many units of fillings and crowns a month, plus their toothaches and broken tooth. And they don't do anything fancy. They're just supply and demand. They're rural, not downtown urban. If they are downtown urban, they have some massive unique selling proposition. And what that is, is usually a dentist who looks like you with this massive um, chair side manners where they just put everybody at ease and they could convince someone living in Antarctica to buy a snow cone and a coat. You know, I mean, they just, they just have the most amazing personality, the big cosmetic legends in America, like, like um, Phil Dorfman, uh, Bill Dorfman and uh, Beverly Hills and yep. um, the other guy, uh, Larry Rosenthal in Manhattan. I mean, these guys are just Mr. Personality, Mr. Smooth. So, and then, and then some introvert geek dentist who can't even make eye contact with you wants to go to Beverly Hills and he thinks if he buys a laser and a computer and a CAD cam and search engine optimization, he's going to be the next Bill Dorfman. It's like, dude, uh, you know, you, you, there, you have to have a personality. And if you don't have that personality, you got to surround yourself with team members that have that personality. But most people, if you're an introvert geek afraid of your own shadow, you hire five other people that are just like you. And then they'll even say to you, well, I can't stand my hygienist. Well, she's loud. I mean, I can hear her talking to her patient, and I'm three operatories down. And then she doesn't, whenever I say something, she doesn't say, yes, doctor, and then salute me. She starts telling me her opinion, and if I taped her mouth shut, she'd fart to death. What is wrong with that lady? And it's like, no, dude, what is wrong with you? But, hey, so I can't wait to go to Australia and have lunch with you. And uh, that's going to be so fun. I hope you meet my brother someday. He's uh, the most amazing man, and he's totally opposite of me. He's nice. He's handsome. He's charming. He's pleasant. He's, uh, I don't even think we're related. Uh, I think my mom might have had an affair on my dad because I don't know how me and Paul, he's just too sweet. damn sweet. A, 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 a switch at the hospital. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank you so much um, for coming on the show and uh, tell all my homies down in Australia. By the way, on Dental Town, um, I was looking at the numbers today. There's 4,500 registered dentists on Dentaltown from um, Australia. And wow. then there's another uh, several hundred from New Zealand. So uh, if you post any of your blogs or your uh, these uh, um, Monday morning, uh, Monday management meetings uh, on your uh, on Dentaltown, uh, you'll reach a lot of Australians. Okay. I, think, I think the dentists really love uh, the international part of the community. Like, like Australia with Jeffrey Knight um, in Australia and Graham Milicic in New Zealand. They're big into glass on them or like Japan is. And the Americans aren't so much. They, they, love, they love seeing how uh, people around the world approach the same patient with the same cavity. I mean, we treat carious disease, cavity disease, gum disease, occlusal disease. And some of that stuff is straightforward, but some of it is completely voodoo religion like uh, occlusion. I mean, there's almost every country has three or four different leaders who don't agree on anything. So there's a lot of uh, Austra There's a lot of Australians on Dentaltown. I can't wait to go there. Good I'll stuff. see you in a couple of weeks, buddy. Thanks very much, Howard. And thank you, Ryan. This is my Father's Day present. Ryan's working on a Sunday on Father's Day. Thank you, Ryan, so much. You, uh, you man, you hustle. No doubt about it. Have a great day. Founder of Dental Profit System, Angus Pryor has a decade sales and marketing experience with healthcare professionals. He's a marketer. In a modern world, you cannot afford not to be online. Patients are looking for you online every day and you need to be there and you need to own that space in your local area. He holds a master's degree in marketing from the University of Southern Queensland. At Dental Profit System, he surrounds himself with a hand-picked team of experts in related fields. He has a growing network of clients around Australia. His Marketing Monday video show provides dentists with quick, actionable tips to boost their dental marketing. So action steps for this week. 
have a think what it is that you can do that actually makes that measurable and something that patients actually value. Anyone needing digital marketing advice, I strongly recommend Angus and his team from Dental Profit System. He's an author. He has columns in Australasian Dental Practice Magazine, Australasian Dentist and ADA's News Bulletin Magazine. In 2017, he co-authored a best-selling book achieving 20,000 Kindle downloads on the first day. Dental Profit System has been a real help to me in setting up my new business. Their online marketing is bringing in a steady flow of new patients. He's a speaker. So the topic today is how to generate new patients on demand. So today we're going to look at three ways to boost patient numbers. As a dentist in Australia, you really need to be ahead of your game, otherwise you get left behind. The challenge we face is though, the connection between having good business and being a good technical dentist is the worst it's ever been. It's been a really, really fruitful experience. I think it's really helped my practice grow. Uh, this football match that frankly has been a bit of a shambles, it's very lopsided and of course there can be some parallels between this and business, dare sure. we say. Oh, yeah. The fact is you're going you're gonna to make me more confident, you're going to give me a brighter smile. And that's the offering that this practice has made to the marketplace. The good news is for Stephanie, they know what their average patient value is. That's actually what they're buying, but often what I see being sold is we're friendly and we've got good technical skills. Can you just turn to the person next to you and say, you are elite? <laughs> and if they weren't enthusiastic, they should be. The fact that you're here means you're elite. What we're about is helping dentists grow their business. As our name suggests, we're Dental Profit System.